Father, we want to come this morning and worship you because you inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, we want to come in and give you thanks and glory because, Lord, you're worthy of that. And so this morning, Lord, as we open our hearts and surrender and raise our hands in worship, Father, move among your people this morning. And whatever it is we have need of, Father, minister to that need, we would ask in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing as we begin our worship. your name, the mountain shake and crumble, at your name, the oceans roar and tumble, at your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, the people cry out, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Lord of 
of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise Yahweh Yahweh we love to shout your name oh Lord and your name the morning breaks in glory and your name Creation sings your story. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we'd love to shout your name, oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God, we will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God, we will sing, we will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. And Lord of all the earth, we shout your name. Shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all and all. Seeking you as a precious truth. Lord, to give up I be a fool. You are my all and all. Let's sing that again. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all and all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all and all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, risking again, I bless your name. You are my all and all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all and all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. 
Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Lamb of God, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, worthy is your name. Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your Find the way and bring me back to you. You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. You're all. Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm No one else will do There's nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way Bring me back to You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are
Everybody but stand. Father, as we're doing our best to serve you, you know, Lord, as we're in the word and as we're in fellowship with one another, as we're in prayer with you, Father, doing our devotions in the morning, spending that personal, private, intimate time with you, Lord, we, we do find that sometimes Lord, we just need for you to wash again and recircumcise again our hearts. You know, this world can, can try to creep in, Father, and we just need for you, for you Father, just to, to cleanse us and to wash us and to create in us a right spirit. And this morning, if there's any here in our fellowship or those listening by way of the uh, life uh, whatever that thing is called, streaming. 
Lord, uh, technology. Father, that you, Lord, today would just lift every burden. Remove, Father, the shame of their failure as they have repented. And God, just restore in them just a clean heart. That fresh filling of your spirit that they might again experience the goodness of the Lord. And Father, I just pray that this morning. And then every other thing that they may have need of, whether it's financial, you know, physical, marital, you know, their children, prodigals maybe, Lord, what all uh, the other stuff might be, Father, we pray that you would just minister to that this morning. And of course, Lord, we want to pray for the many in our fellowship that are sick, Pastor Aaron and Pastor Tim, uh, Lord, we want to pray for a quick recovery for them. They don't, don't spread it to their families as they're home with a high fever and just violently ill. Pray for them, Father. You know, Lord, we want to pray for one of our board members who has the wonderful privilege, Jim and Susan Stubblefield, to be at their niece's wedding this week. And Lord, bless that. Bless that, Father. And just all the others that are traveling. Um, and Lord, there's one that's on a Alaskan cruise. I don't know that you should bless her, <laughs> but uh, keep her safe anyway, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, amen, amen. amen. And spend a few moments greeting one another before you find your places.
Okay, if we can find our places, we'll get going this morning. I just have one announcement that's, uh, again, um, pretty important that you listen up. Family camp is coming um, quickly, the 13th of July, that uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll be up um, there at Bear Valley at the PG&E uh, group campground. So if you're not planning on camping and, um, and you're going to come up for Sunday, we'll have maps out in the foyer for, for you to be able to find your way there. It's real simple. You just go up Highway 20. After you come down into Bear Valley and it flattens out and you start back up again, take the next left, we'll be right on the left within about two miles in. So it's not hard to find. But if uh, you're going to be going up on Sunday only, we still need you to sign up so we know how much food. We have the big barbecue and uh, with all the fixings and everything there Sunday after the service. And we have some ice cream. You know, we have ice cream Sundays after that. We want to make sure, and not so much for the hamburgers and hot dogs, but that we have enough ice cream. Because I can guarantee you, I will scream if we don't have enough ice cream. And yeah, you show up without putting your name down, so we'll make sure we have enough. And so make sure you sign up if you're going to go camping up there. And then if you're going to get baptized, if you haven't been baptized yet, we're going to have a baptismal while we're up there. There's a creek that flows beyond uh, where the campsite is, and we'll all walk down there and do that. So you've been fair warned. Amen? Hey, let's turn our Bibles again to the book of Hebrews. We're going to finish chapter 10 this morning. Next week we'll be in chapter 11, and then the following week we will finish our studies through the book of Hebrews. You can be reading ahead. The next book we'll take um, will be the book of Jude. We'll be studying that here on Sunday mornings after we finish the book of Hebrews. We pretty much in the last three years completed the New Testament again. Soon we'll be finishing 2 Corinthians on Wednesday nights, and so... As we're finishing that, we're going to be uh, picking up the book of John, the Gospel of John. So those are things that you can be looking into and reading ahead. So as you're turning there to Hebrews chapter 10, we've come as far as verse 26. That's where we'll pick up this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. You know, it is a lamp unto our feet and it's a light unto our path. It is living and it is powerful. It goes right down into the heart of the matter and deals with the matters of the heart. And it builds faith. It speaks to us of your promises and of your faithfulness. It tells us of this great salvation that you have purchased for whosoever will come and accept it. And then it tells us, Lord, of your keeping power, how you preserve the saints, how you guard those of us that have dedicated our lives to you, Father, and how you just are a father to your children, your sons and your daughters. So this morning, as we look at a very difficult passage that has been scrutinized and debated over for, for hundreds of years in the church, Lord, help us to unpack the truth that's found therein. Make it clear. Make it understandable. We want to simply teach the truth simply so that everybody can understand it. And so, Lord, as we look through this today, speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the reasons why we didn't go any further last week is we started the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews is we're coming to a section that is most controversial. There are those that believe in the body of Christ, that you can lose your salvation. That you are not eternally secure in Christ Jesus. I'm not one of them. My soteriology, and that is the study of your salvation, uh, at the end of it, I believe this. I believe that what God began is, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, what God began, it says this, being confident of this very thing, that that which... The Lord began that good work that he began in you. He is able to complete unto the day of Christ. In other words, if you are saved this morning and you've begun this walk, you are blood-bought, blood-washed, spirit-filled. 
You've come to the cross and you've acknowledged that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And you've asked Jesus Christ through faith. The word has stirred in your heart that you believe that he is the Savior, that he is the Son of God. And you've confessed that with your mouth. And you believe that in your heart. The Bible declares in Romans 10, 9, and 10, you're saved. And what God begins, God is able to finish. Jude tells us this in that one little chapter epistle, that little short, pithy little epistle of Jude. He starts in verse 1 by saying this, To them that are sanctified, set apart by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. He begins the epistle that way, and this is how he finishes it. He finishes in verse 24 by saying this, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. In other words, he's saying that he's able to keep that which you've committed unto him. He's able to preserve you faultless unto the day of the Lord. Blameless. And then we read in John 10, 28 and 29, and listen to this carefully. He says, and this is Jesus speaking, I give you to understand and, and I want you to know that to them I give eternal life, he says, they shall never perish. To those that, that the Lord has given eternal life, they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all. In other words, once the Father has given you to Jesus and you become a part of the body of Christ and you're placed in the protective hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says that no one will be able to pluck you out. It goes on in verse 29 and says, And no man is able to pluck you out of my Father's hand. Nobody can remove you from that. 1 Peter 1, 5 says, We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. That word to kept means we're guarded. We're protected. We're kept. In Hebrews 7, 25, and we study this as we were working our way through this epistle, it says, Wherefore he is able also to save to the uttermost them that come to him, you know, by God, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for them. So just a few of these verses, as we look at this, we understand in our soteriology that once a man or a woman comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, as Paul writes back in Hebrews, and turn with me to chapter 6, because this kind of goes along with this. And again, I want to carefully unpack this this morning. Because I know within Christendom today, there is that teaching that can cause you to be quite spasmodic in your walk, not to have the assurance and the hope that you ought to have. To not understand that there's an anchor for your soul that's beyond the veil that's sure and steadfast. To understand that those that have come to Christ and received that gift, what God has begun, He will finish. Those are important things to understand. But there's two passages as we work our way through the book of Hebrew that have had great controversy over the years. The first one we unpacked there back in chapter 6, starting in verse 4. Because when you read verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, it would seem on the surface that he's saying that you could lose your salvation. And if you did, you could never be restored back again. But that's not what's being said. You have to understand what Paul is doing here. In the Latin, it's a reductio adam absurdum. It means he's reducing his argument to an absurdity. Listen carefully to what he says. For it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened. Now, here's a description of a saved person. And notice very carefully, he doesn't use this description as we get over in the rest of chapter 10. Note that. For it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, that means their mind has been illuminated by the Holy Spirit, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, that gift of grace. They've tasted, they become a partaker of God's grace, that gift of grace, that gift of forgiveness. And we're made partakers of the Holy Spirit. You are regenerated and renewed and restored through the work of the Holy Spirit. And the moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit makes its abode in you. Now you become a recipient of the Holy Spirit. And you've tasted of the good word of God. 
Again, as Paul talks about in, in, in the letter to the Romans, he says, you know, listen, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the faith that he's talking about there is faith that leads to salvation. That word of God going in your heart and producing that faith that leads to salvation. He says, if you've tasted of the good word of God and again of the power of the world to come. Now watch carefully how he, he brings an absurdity here. He says, if they should fall away. If they should somehow lose this salvation to renew them again to repentance, it's impossible. Why is it impossible? The key to understanding that verse is the word renew. It's anakiniso, which means that God would have to send his son a second time. He would have to be crucified all over again, seeing that the first time didn't stick or didn't take. And if he had to do that, it would put him to an open shame because what you would have to say is what he did the first time wasn't enough. It wasn't effective. You're denying the efficacious, effective, sacrificial work of Christ on the cross. What you're saying is the Christ, that Christ's work on the cross wasn't enough to keep you. That somehow you could discard that. And so what Paul is saying here is that it's impossible to lose your salvation. If you have been enlightened, if you have been a recipient of God's grace, if you've been a partaker of the Holy Spirit, if you've tasted of the good word of God, if you have tasted of the power of the world to come, because should you fall away, what would be necessary is for Christ, and that's what the word anokinesa means, crucified anew, all over again. And you remember the story as the nation of Israel was coming out of Egypt and the uh, rock stopped producing water, you remember and the Lord instructed Moses, go out and strike the rock. And Moses went out and he struck the rock and water came out and their thirst was quenched. But as they journeyed further, the rock again stopped producing water. And the Lord told Moses, go out and what? Speak to the rock. But Moses, being angry with the people, didn't go out and speak to the rock. What did he do? He went out and struck it a second time. And striking it a second time... What he was doing was showing the analogy that Christ could be struck more than once. And although water came out, God said to Moses, come here, son, we got some things to discuss. Because of your failure to proper represent me at the waters of Mirabah, you will not be permitted to take my people into the promised land. Because your imagery was that Christ would be struck twice when he only needed to be struck once. This is what Paul is saying here. It's a reduction in absurdity. He's saying it's impossible if this has happened to you for you to lose this because you would have to denounce the efficacious work of the cross. You would have to say that the blood was not effective, that what God began, he could not complete. And if you say that, then you put him to an open shame. So as we approach chapter 10 now, and we come to verse 26, we come across another one of those controversial sections that we have to unpack this morning. Because if you read it at the surface, it would seem like that a man could lose his salvation. And so let's just kind of read through verse 30, uh, 30 and then 31, and then we'll come back and we'll unpack it. Starting in verse 26, Hebrews chapter 10. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment of fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye, Shall he be the worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherein he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite or insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of a living God. I can't tell you when I first got saved how many times I'd heard that passage preached in the denomination that I got saved in, trying to scare literally the hell out of you, literally, 
because they were proclaiming that there was the possibility that once you were regenerated, as described back in chapter 6, you could lose your salvation. In fact, every Sunday night we had an evangelistic service, and if you had sinned during the week, you could come and get saved all over again. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's important, again, that we go back to the Old Testament and find out the reference that Paul is making here. Because notice this, he is writing to who? Hebrews. And these Hebrews would have understood Hebrew history. And as Paul begins to reference some of these things, the imagery that they were taught all of their life, because a 12-year-old Jewish boy could have quoted their first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, by memory before his bar mitzvah. He would have been well acquainted with what Paul was saying. The minute Paul begins to talk about if we sin willfully, there was some imagery that would have come to his mind. After we've received the knowledge of the truth. It doesn't say here, note carefully with me, it doesn't say after you were converted. It doesn't mention any of those things mentioned there in chapter 6. It simply means after truth has come to you. And you might be here this morning and are not saved. You've never come to that place of giving your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, of asking Him to apply His blood to your life and cleanse you of your sins. But you've heard it. You've heard the gospel message. You've sat under the ministry of the Word. You have a knowledge of what is required. You have a knowledge, at least intellectually so, of this gospel message, but you have not responded to it. There are those people today that might be listening you know, by way of the internet or might be here sitting here this morning that you've heard, but you have not responded. And what he's saying here, if you continue to willfully, deliberately, defiantly be obedient, be disobedient to the gospel message after the knowledge of the truth has been presented to you. If you deny that sacrifice and you count an unworthy thing and the blood of Christ an unholy thing, there's no more sacrifice for your sin because there's only one. Not all roads lead to heaven. There's been a revival, it seems, lately of this false teaching of universalism. That as long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter what religion you belong to, all roads lead to heaven. They do not. Jesus said, I'm the only way, the only truth, the only life. No man goes to the Father but by me. All others are thieves and robbers. There's only one door. You know, I was speaking to a guy out at Ananda out here where they, they worship Yogananda. And when I had my heating air company, I I was invited to come out there and do some work on their main, I don't know, you you can't call it a sanctuary because there's nothing sanctified that goes on in there, but their meeting hall. And I was invited to come out to their meeting hall and look at the air conditioning and some of the private homes had some problems and needed service and we were really bidding for the contract of that community. And I thought, what a great opportunity. So I studied up on what they believed, and when I went out there, sure enough, in one of the guy's homes, he had a little room set up as a shrine, and he had a picture of all of these gurus, and right in the middle was Jesus. You know, the typical picture of Jesus. And so I asked him, who is that? He said, that's Jesus. I said, who are all these other guys? And I named off all of these different, you know, uh, ascended masters. I said, this is a marvelous thing to me. And he goes, really? You want to learn more about it? I said, no, no, I already know enough about it. This is a marvelous thing to me. And he goes, why? Because they had candles burning to it. He goes, why is this a marvelous thing to you? And I said, because that guy right there, Jesus, said all the other guys are liars. (laughs) And he said, he's the only way. What? I said, yeah, you got a Bible around here? No, but I got one in a truck. I'll go get it. And I came and I showed him. I said, listen, Jesus said, the one you have right there, he said, all these other guys are liars. And he's the only way, the only truth, the only life. No man can come to the Father but by him. And he offered himself as a sacrifice once. Hebrews, watch the flow of Hebrews once and for all. 
And there is no need for any other sacrifice because after he offered that, he was seated. He said the priests that ministered around the tabernacle or later the temple, they stood daily offering the same sacrifices over and over. But Jesus offering one sacrifice was seated because the work was done. Amen. You can applaud that. The work was done. Waiting until his enemies would be made his footstool. The rock only needed to be struck once. In chapter 6, that's the absurdity that Paul is bringing. It's impossible to strike Christ twice. And that's what would be needed if you were to fall away, if you could fall away from your faith. But if you've had this experience, you will never fall away. Because that which you've committed unto him, he's able, he is able to keep against that day. Now you might be in a woodshed a lot because the Bible says he disciplines them that he loves. Amen? Anybody felt a few love taps this week? But you will never not be his. We have to understand this premise. This is the foundation we come to when we understand doctrine. Because listen, I have a son. I have three daughters. I have children. You know, and man, it was hard giving birth to those kids. My wife had it easy. She got to lay in the bed. I'm the one that had to do all the pacing and praying. You know, and, and worrying. And... Amen, men? You know what I'm talking about. I was in there. I was in there. I watched. I'm in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> but I will tell you this. When they came out, they were covered with all kinds of icky stuff, but they were mine. And they have to take that thing, you know, and get the stuff out of the nose. and mouth. Ooh, but they were mine. These little slime balls, that was mine. It was mine. They were born into my family. They would forever bear my name. Well, at least my son. But now you got that hyphenated thing now. Destiny Warren Calhoun. So they still have my name. But my blood would flow through their veins forever. And I would never, as any good father, would never say to any one of them, pack your bag, change your name, and get out of here. I never want to see you again. But what I will do is discipline because I love them. When we come to this passage, we have to understand those that are the Lord's, the Lord is able to keep. He will guard, he will protect. But you got to be his. You see, I can't correct your children. And they don't bear my name. And they don't have my blood flowing in them. You see, they have to be. And the neat thing about it is Ephesians tells us when you get saved, you're adopted and you get an inheritance. And listen, you get your father's name. He writes you down in his book of life and it will never be erased. So any good Hebrew coming to this passage would have understood what Paul was saying because Paul is quoting from Numbers chapter 15. And we need to turn there for a moment so I can unpack this so that you can leave here today going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for keeping me and guarding me. Thank you for, for preserving me blameless unto the day. Thank you one of these days that you will present me faultless before your Father with exceeding joy. But when you come to Numbers 15, there the Lord is instructing Moses about how to deal with sin. Later on when Leviticus lays out the need for the sin offering and the trespass offering, Notice there are two offerings. It's right there in the first couple chapters. The first offering is the sin offering. And by the way, how many know the difference between sin and trespass? Okay, the word in the Greek for sin is to miss the mark. It is the pictorial picture of an archer pulling back his bow, aiming very carefully at the target, determined to hit the bullseye, and yet he misses. So he's done everything he can to hit the target, but he misses. 
And the Bible says all have sinned. Some of us very carefully pulled back that bow and aimed that arrow with the intent of hitting the target, but we missed. Still needs to be repented of because all have come short of the glory of God. God's requirement is perfection. In other words, you have to hit the target every time. And we've come short of that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Trespass is a whole other issue. Trespass is you know that the line is drawn and there's the line and God says don't cross over it. You fold your arms and you cross over it anyway. Both of those violations against God's law had a sacrifice that could be offered to cleanse the person of doing such a thing. But I want you to see that even in the trespass, there was an apologetic and repentant attitude afterwards. Now here's what he's saying. Watch the flow. So he's talking about offerings that need to be made for sin and trespass. And he comes to verse 29 of chapter 15, and I want you to follow the flow very carefully. Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance. That word ignorance there is shagag in the Hebrew. Let's say it all together. Shagag. It's an important word. Say it again. Shagag. You know what it means? One who sins apologetically and repentantly. Now listen, if you're a saved person today, I want you to know that you still sin, don't you? Do I need to tell you that? Holiness is not so much an action as is an attitude. What is your attitude when you sin? What is your attitude when you transgress God's law? Is there a quick brokenness? Is there an apologetic attitude toward that? Yeah, because the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you and He convicts you of that sin. That's how you know you're saved. You see, years ago when I was a youth pastor, there was a lady that came to the office and I could hear her literally get out of her car and start walking to the main office. She was wailing and crying that loud. And I'm thinking, what in the world? And I thought, well, that's great. You know, I'm only the youth pastor, the senior pastor. That's his job. He gets the big bucks. And all of a sudden, I hear the intercom ring and say, yeah, Pastor Mike. And I said, yeah. He goes, listen, uh, uh, the other pastor, Harold, he's out to lunch. And uh, this lady needs to talk to one of the staff, and you're it. I go, really? Can she come back later? And I can hear her over the intercom, ah, ah. You know how women can be sometimes? I'm really, if I'm in trouble, I'm just going to stay in trouble through the whole message. Just screaming wailing, crying. And I'm thinking, Lord. You know, so I said, bring her in. I'm thinking, you come in with her. And I'm thinking, Lord, I don't need this today. And she came in. I'm not kidding you. It took 15 minutes for me to understand anything that she was saying. And she finally fell on the floor, prostrate. And I'd never seen anybody cry that hard in my life. I, I, I listen, <clears throat> allergies set in on me, and tears began to well in my eyes just watching her. And finally, the secretary and I got her calmed down enough to understand that what she was upset about is she believed that she had committed the unpardonable sin and that she had lost her salvation. Now, I'm a youth pastor. I didn't have any wisdom in this area. I'm fresh out of Bible college. I'm doing my two-year internship here. And I get this hard case. What do you do? You pray. And I said, Lord, I... What? This would be a good time for the rapture. You could take me out of here. Yeah, give, beat me up, Jesus. And the Lord just said, tell her that she wouldn't feel the way she feels if she had committed the unpardonable sin. The very fact that she's grieved over what she did shows that she's saved because unsaved people don't grieve that way. 
wow, that's cool. I'm going to look wise in front of everybody right now. And I laid that on her. She goes, I never thought of that. And I said, please, don't tell me what you did. You can tell the pastor later. But I'm telling you right now, because you are apologetic and repentant. The sacrifices in the Old Testament were only efficacious and effective for those that did it apologetically and repentantly. That's what he's saying here. Listen, he says, there should be one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, apologetically and repentantly, shagag, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and the stranger that sojourns with you, but the soul that doth ought presumptuously. That word means willfully, blatantly, defiantly, and deliberately. And the reason we know that because as we read on in through the rest of this chapter, we have an example given after he gives this law of one who had done the very thing. He said, but the one who does it that way, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproaches the Lord. Man, he, this is a reproach against the Lord. That soul shall be cut off from among his people. And then you have the stories you read on of a man out gathering firewood on the Sabbath. And some folks saw him gathering firewood, which was a violation of the law on the Sabbath. And they put him in jail, and they, the elders there sought the Lord, what should we do with the guy? I mean, what's the penalty? And the word came back from the Lord, you put him to death. Can you imagine? When I first read that, the first time I thought through the Old Testament, I thought, wow. That seems harsh. But what I failed to realize is what was the attitude behind him gathering the wood. You see, he had heard the law. Every person in Israel had heard the law. In fact, they heard the voice of God from Mount Sinai, and they knew Moses went up to get the law. He did not do this ignorantly. But willfully and defiantly, And how could he do that willfully and defiantly? Because he had no regard for the Lord God of heaven. If he had no regard for the Lord God of heaven, then he wasn't a saved man. This is what Paul is saying. Let's go back now as we finish out Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. This is what he's referencing. Every sin can be forgiven. Except for the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, every sin. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to defiantly rebel, deliberately, willfully, against the Holy Spirit's call to repentance. A call to come to Christ for salvation. And if you continue to do that, that voice will grow weaker and weaker and weaker until soon you will have seared your conscience with a hot iron. You become a reprobate and there's no means by which God can call you, so you're eternally lost. What he's saying here, if we sin willfully, he's writing to these Hebrews. He said, listen, the gospel message came to you guys. You heard it. You understood it. In fact, to a certain degree, you even associated with it. But you didn't go far enough to believing to the saving of your soul, and you've drawn back from that if you draw back, if you willfully, after you've received the knowledge of the truth, if you willfully sin, defiantly and deliberately, you reject the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for your sins. But a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Listen, one of the other doctrines we believe in this church is there's a little heaven and there's a literal hell. Some have tried to allegorize that away. Listen, Jesus spoke more of hell than he did of heaven. And the one thing we know about hell, it was never created for humanity. It was created for the fallen angels. But God is just and holy. And if you commit the same crime as an angel and rebelling against God, then guess what? You're going to go the same place. Now listen, Jesus has done everything to keep you from that place. He's paid the price for you not to have to go to that place. He sent the Holy Spirit to convict you of sin and of righteousness and of judgment so you won't go to that place. You know, I, my older sister just to this day doesn't get it. And I remember one of my first conversations with her right after I got saved. 
And she literally told me, when I stand before God, I want to give him a piece of my mind. I said, listen, Debbie, you can't afford to give anybody a piece of your mind. You ain't got much left. You know, all the drugs and stuff. But I'll tell you this. Well, if he's a God of love, how could he send anybody to hell? How many have heard that statement? If he's a God of love. No, he is a God of love to the extent he sent his son. And that God of love watched his son be brutalized and beaten and crucified. He is a God of love. But he's a holy God. He rent the veil and he invites whosoever will come can be saved. But if you don't come, if you say, I don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, I don't believe that his blood has any efficacious or efficient, uh, uh, effective work, I don't believe it's sufficient, and you do despite the spirit of grace, you resist it, listen, you've sent yourself there. God didn't send you there. He did everything to keep you from going there. That's what Paul is talking about here. And you have to look forward to hell because you chose hell. No one will be in hell that doesn't choose hell because you've given a choice. Choose you this day whom you can serve, who you will serve. You can choose heaven today. It's yours. And by the way, the ticket to get there has already been purchased. It's a gift. But the Bible says that this place of hell is a place of outer darkness. It's a place of eternal torment. It's where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's the description the Bible gives of this place. A place of torment. And this God of love says, I don't want you to go there. This is how bad I don't want you to go there. I created that for the fallen angels that rebelled against me, but I don't want you to go there. I'll tell you what, I'll pay the price so you don't have to go there. I will take your sin and put it on me, and I'll take my righteousness and put it on you. If you'll only come, I will give you grace that is sufficient. I'll give you a garment so white and clean you can stand before a holy God and not be consumed. If you'll come. But if you refuse to come, if you sin willfully, after you have heard or received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more. That's it. That's the only one. And then he says, and this is the reference back there to Numbers, he that despised Moses' law without mercy, you know, under two or three witnesses, received his judgment. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be the worthy. Now here's what you have to have done. You've trodden underfoot the Son of God. You have to literally trample over the cross and everything the cross means. And you can't say you don't know, because every time you write the date, you're speaking of the cross. Do you know how we get to 2012 A.D.? Adodomini. Do you even know what that means? 2012, the year of our Lord. B.C., before the cross. After that, the year of our Lord. We mark time in this country by the cross. History looking forward to the cross. History looking back to the cross. The cross is the central theme of history. You can't get away from the cross. Because it stands as a monument of God's willingness to pardon you and me. And the means by which he did it. You would have to trample right over the cross. What, and, and you have to understand the imagery here. The most filthy part of your body in the eastern mindset is what? The bottom of your feet. You would have to expose the bottom of your feet, the greatest insult you can do. You would expose that to Jesus as he laid there on the cross, being nailed to it. You, would exp you have to trample overfoot the cross. And the one being nailed to that cross is God in fleshly form. Because it required a perfect sacrifice to remove our sins. You have to trample 
underfoot the Son of God. You have to count the blood of the covenant wherein you are sanctified, an unholy thing. How many even religions that say, oh, you believe in the blood? Oh, you, that's a, that's a bloody religion. You bet it is. You bet it is. Because it's the only agency by which God can wash sin. Without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission of sin. You better thank God every day that he's willing to shed his blood. Because it wasn't until the blood touched the mercy seat that your sins were forgiven. And you say it had no effect. The blood had no effect. In the Old Testament, we read there during the Passover, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Listen, we're not ashamed of this gospel. That's the means by which we are saved. You count the blood of his covenant wherein he was sanctified and the holy thing. And then you have to do despite the spirit of grace, the spirit of God who's coming and wooing and calling and convicting and making the word of God real. I remember the night I got saved. Listen, I had no defense against it. The word of God, I knew that moment was quick and powerful because God opened up something in my heart and reached down inside of me and touched something so deep I had no defense against it. I couldn't have defended myself against it if I wanted to. And I knew then by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God that what that man was saying was the absolute truth. And I had a decision to make that night, that moment. Today was the day of salvation for me. And when I went forward and I got saved, listen, from that moment on, I became his and he was mine. And what he began in me that night 38 years ago, and I'm going to tell you, it's been a rough road. Sometimes I look like a pinball. Bing, 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 bing. How many look like that? Don't raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about. Tilt, tilt, you know, get another shot at it. But he's never let me go. When I've been unfaithful, he has remained faithful. And I've found that his grace is more than efficient. Yes, I have sinned to my shame as a believer. But apologetically and repentantly so. I've come back to the cross many, many times and said, Father, forgive me, I've sinned against you. Wash me again in the blood of your Son. You know what he says to me? Having once been washed, you need not be washed again. You're already clean. But Lord, just do it one more time. I don't need to do it one more time. But what I will tell you is you're forgiven. Now go and sin no more. Despite the spirit of grace, for we know him that hath said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Now, again, who is he writing to? The Hebrews. What is he saying to these Hebrews? You remember the parable that that Jesus spoke of the great king who had a prince for a son, and it was the prince's wedding or anniversary or party or something he was throwing for the guy. And he said to the servants, go out into the highways and byways and invite all of his friends. Let him come. And, you know, as the servants came back, the first said, well, you know, I went out and talked to this guy that was one of his best friends. And he said, well, I I can't come because I've just bought a piece of property. I got to go check it out. And another one came and said, well, I bought some oxen. I got to go test them. And a third one said, I've taken a wife and she won't let me come out and play. That's paraphrase. I'm already in trouble. I'm just going to stay there today. (laughs) You ladies can line up afterwards and beat me senseless. And they came back and they reported to the great king. And he said, listen, you go out into the highways and byways and you invite the whosoever that will come to this feast. Israel rejected. You and I were grafted in. The warning here is to Israel. The Lord shall judge his people. You rejected your Messiah. Can you imagine what they're going to feel like on that day as Zechariah says their eyes are open and they realize they crucified the Messiah. And they're going to bewail him as one who's lost his only son. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Wow. 
And so the warning here is not one who's been saved who loses the salvation. The warning is, is one who's been hearing the message and treating it as though it is nothing. Treating the gospel as though it is nothing. Treating the cross as though it is nothing. Treating the blood of his sacrifice as though it's nothing. And resisting the spirit of his grace who willfully, deliberately, and defiantly continues on their course in sin. That's who he's talking about here. And now he says to these, now watch this, it says in verse 32, because as we go through the rest, we'll get it in the context. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, there was some revelation that came to you. You understood these things. You endured great fight of affliction. Listen, you... you, you Associated with those being persecuted. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, that is an object of ridicule, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of those that were so used. You you kind of associated yourself at first. You thought, well, this is not right that these, these Hebrews that are converting to Christianity, that are confessing that Christ was the Messiah, should be treated this way. So you kind of joined company with them for a, for a season, for a while. It says in verse 34, furthermore, for you had compassion on me in my bonds, and you took joyfully the spoil of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have in heaven a better and enduring sacrifice. Listen, you, you started to move toward that well. And then the warning is this in verse 35, cast not away, therefore, your confidence Keep moving that way, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, patience, steadfastness, that after you've done the will of God, after you've done these good things, you might receive the promise. They hadn't received the promise yet, that you might move forward to receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he shall come. He will come, and he will not tarry. Now the just, he's quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now here is how he wraps it up, how Paul wraps it up. Verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back to destruction. But we are of them who believe to the saving. We move forward into the saving of our souls. And all of chapter 11 is an example of how this faith settles into your heart and the things that it produces. How do we know we're saved this morning? Because faith produces something. The moment you got saved, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Your view of sin is never going to be the same. The night I got saved, I was forever ruined for this world. I could no longer sin willfully, deliberately, defiantly, and have any pleasure in it. From then on, the Spirit of God lives in me. And those times when I fall into sin or I trespass, listen, man, I am broken over that. The Holy Spirit is grieved in me over that. I can never go out and do that again. Because faith is an action word. We're going to get that next week as we work our way through the 11th chapter. He's going to tell us faith, 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 faith. These are the things that faith produces. That's why James says, if you say that you have faith and I only have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Works does not produce faith, but faith, faith will always produce works. Did you hear that? Works will not bring salvation. Works cannot even produce faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But faith will always produce works because faith is an action word and so let's tie a knot in our study this morning so we don't misunderstand this chapter all Paul is saying is this if you've heard you better listen carefully because if you've heard and you reject there's no other sacrifice for you Christ was sacrificed once. And if you come to that, and you've been regenerated by that, you've 
tasted of it, you've become a partaker of it, then God has saved you and he will preserve you and keep you. If you're only hearing it and you haven't come to it, you need to be careful lest you draw back from it. And it's the whole thing of the sower of the seeds that Jesus taught in, in Matthew chapter 13. You remember the four kinds of seed. The one seed was sown, and the seed is the word of God. It was sown, and immediately the devil came, which was a type of the birds, and snatched it away. Today, as this thing is live streaming, and as you're listening, the word of God is being sown. And some will sit and listen, whether they're in, we have people listening from Liberia and Russia, parts of Russia, and and Ghana, and all over the world. Some will hear this message, and they will say, ah, what's that? And immediately, the enemy will snatch it from them. The third kind is those who fall among thorns and thistles, and the cares of this life. It sprouted, but the cares of this life drowned it out because they love the world more than they love the Lord. And before that plant could reach maturity, the the thorns and the thistles drown it out. The fourth is what we want to be, is it fell on good soil and it produced fruit. But the second, I think, is what he's talking about here. The seed that fell on stony ground. And it sprang up for a moment. And the one who it fell on had great joy for a moment. But there was no root. It didn't go down deep. Faith didn't have its work in the heart. It only came to the head. And it says when offenses came because of the word of God. When the word of God says you can't do that anymore. You can't fornicate. You can't commit adultery. You've got to stop doing drugs. You can, listen, the spirit of God is in you. You can't continue to practice sin as a way of life. When they were offended by that, they fell away. You know why? Because they didn't move into saving faith. That faith that changes a man from the inside out. That faith that puts the fear of God in a man or a woman. That faith that says that I know that I know that God is real. He's changed my life. He lives in me. The word is real. And I'm going to be obedient. And when I don't and am not obedient, I'm going to repent. Because it's in me to do that. The sins I commit today, and I will probably sin before the day is out, they will be shagag apologetically and repentantly repented of because it's not in my heart to sin against the living God. Sin to me is an oops. And sometimes I get snared in it and I hate it. It's no longer a pleasurable thing for me and I certainly don't do it willfully and defiantly and deliberately. It is part of the struggle between the old man and the new man. And some days I just can't get that guy in the coffin. He gets loose. Understand what I'm saying? But he is not talking here about a person losing their salvation. You are saved by grace through faith that not of yourself, it is a gift from God. If God gave it to you and God chooses for you to have that gift, then how are you going to ungive it? Not of works lest you could boast. It's not, it has nothing to do with you. But you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, under good works. God foreordained that you should walk in them. He that began that good work in you will finish it. And all of Paul is warning here that these Hebrews, you've heard. You've heard. In fact, you've gone so far as to do good things to Paul. And you've done good things to your Hebrew brothers who have been converted. But you need to endure and go on further to saving faith. To the faith that saves the soul and not draw back. Amen? Because the Lord has no pleasure in those who draw back. And then he concludes, and watch this, I love this. Because he says here, but of them that believe to save me. But we are not of them. Who draw back. Amen. We are not of them who draw back. Knocked down but not knocked out. That's what Paul said. Amen. You get up and you keep fighting. Because it's in you to do that. Because faith as we're going to see next week produces that in you.
saving faith. Amen? So here's the deal. Going back to chapter 6, I just want to read this one more time. If this is your experience, if you've been enlightened and you've tasted of this heavenly gift, this gift of grace, this gift of salvation, and you become a partaker of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God lives in you, you've tasted of the good word of God and the power of the world to come. Listen, it's impossible for you to fall away because to be restored again, like some believe you lose your salvation and get it back, Christ would have had to be crucified all over the second time. And you would have said that the first time wasn't powerful enough. That's what Paul is saying here. And then when he comes over to chapter 10, the rest of it, what he's talking about here is those who have not come to salvation. They're flirting with it. Listen, they're dating Jesus. Jesus isn't their husband. Listen, get a ring on your finger as fast as you can. Amen? Because he's the best husband any bride will ever have. Because we have a sure hope that is an anchor for our soul beyond the veil. Amen. I go to bed at night and I know that I'm saved. Because Jesus did it all. Amen. I don't worry about that. The justification thing is never a problem for me. It's that sanctification thing. Now, that's another issue. The first three chapters of Ephesians teaches us who we are in Christ. He comes to chapter 4 and he says, now walk worthy. Now act like a king's kid. That's always been the rub for me. And then you get to chapter 6 and says, having done all the stand, stand. Just stand. Amen? And while I say that, let's stand. So let me ask you this. I want to pray for some folks this morning. I want to pray for you this morning if you're of that persuasion that God is not immutable, that having saved you, he might change his mind. He might say, well, I've changed my mind. I want to give up on you. Who believes God can do that or would do that? Because I need to pray for you if you do. Listen, what he began... What he began in you, that good work he started in you, he is able to finish. The question never is, are you eternally secure? I have this posed to me. I, I taught, when I taught in Bible college, I taught Bible doctrine. And without exception, there's this argument between the Armenians and the Calvinists. And there's always this argument, are you eternally secure? And my statement is simply this, this morning, and I want to offer it to you and offer you a chance to respond. This is the statement. You are eternally secure in Christ Jesus. The question should never be of your eternal security. It should be, are you in Christ Jesus? Because if you're in Christ Jesus and you're plugged into the vine and you're the branch, you will bear fruit. He will have to come and prune some of those branches and dig them up out of the mire, but you will bear fruit. So the question for me is not, can I lose my salvation? Am I eternally secure? The question for me is, if I'm plugged into the vine, if I'm in Christ, I will bear fruit. And that's how I know I'm saved. If you're not bearing fruit, then you need to examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Because you might just have a head knowledge and not a true conversion. And when hard times come, you might fall away. Because you never believe to the saving of your soul. Are you in Christ Jesus? Because if you're in him and he's in you, nothing can pluck you out of his hand. Nothing. What can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Paul lists several rhetorical questions there, and the answer is always nothing. Amen? So let me ask, how many want in Christ? You've heard the gospel message, and today you want in. You want to know when you leave this place today that, man, I'm in. That what he talked about in the sixth chapter is my experience. And the Bible says you have to confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart. If you want in this morning, it's open to you. Is there anybody? There's one. Somebody else. Two. Anybody else? 
The blood of Christ is sufficient. It can save to the uttermost. And it'll change your life from the inside out. You'll be a new creature in Christ. Man, you'll never view sin the same way. You never will. Anyone else? Several. Come on down. We're going to pray with you. Come on. If you want salvation, come on down. Listen. I don't care what this new age church is saying. There is power in the preaching of the cross. Amen? We are not ashamed of the cross. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. For every culture, for every time, for every people. God desires to save. Amen? And once having been saved, you will never be the same. You will move on to what we're going to see next week in the 11th chapter, what faith does. Amen? Wow, there's quite a few of you this morning. Who's all here for salvation? Raise your hand so I know. Some are here to pray. Wow. Well, here's the deal. The Bible says you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart. You wouldn't be down if you didn't believe in your heart. Now we just got to do the second part, confess with our mouth. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer of confession. And you're just going to repeat it after me if you believe it. And this morning, Christ is going to take you at your word, and he's going to come and make his home in your heart. He's going to, we're going to see a few things. He's going to write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you start this journey of a battle and of a struggle. Amen? So let's just pray this. Lord Jesus, I confess. Say it out loud. Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I confess that I believe that you are God in flesh. The only sacrifice for sin. And your blood is sufficient to cleanse me of all sin. And I ask you to come now and live in my life and be my Lord and my Savior. And I ask it in the name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I want to share something with you this this morning. Now, we're in a battle. I've got to stay right here. I've got some things I want to share with you guys. We're in a battle. And I'll tell you how bad the battle is. Literally, I didn't sleep one wink last night. I could not go to sleep. I woke up this morning exhausted. Woke up. I didn't get to sleep, so I didn't get to wake up. I, I putted around the house all night. I prayed. I read. I studied. I sat down trying to go to sleep. And so when I couldn't get any sleep and I'm exhausted right now, Here's what I knew when I came here this morning. Lord, you must, you must be going to do great things today. Because that devil kept me awake all night long. But I gave him a black eye. So you're going to keep me awake? Then I'm going to pray. And I prayed for hours for you guys. You're going to keep me awake? I'm going to open the word. And I'm going to study. You're going to keep me awake? I want to pray for salvation. I want to pray that many will... This is what I said last night. 3 o'clock, 318 to be exact. I'm praying for salvation. You're going to keep me awake? You're going to cause me to lose sleep? Listen, this is what I'm going to do. Man, listen, that's what you need to do. Here's what you need to know right now. This begins your journey. You're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourself. It is a gift, and it's been given to you today. But now he's got good works that he's foreordained that you walk in them and you need to be in the word and you need to be obedient to the word and whatever the word tells you how to live you need to be obedient to that and if you fall short repent amen you're saved and right now God is dipping his pen in the blood of his son he's recording your name in the book of life never to be erased the second thing everything that you've ever done that's been written against you some have volumes. God's tearing those things up, and they'll never be brought before you again. You are forgiven. And the last thing, all the angels of heaven are going, yeah, wow, look at that. Amazing. God's grace is so amazing. Amen. Amen. Well, you can applaud. These are your, turn around. You see your new brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Well, I'm going to lead you in the song. Where are you standing? I'm going to be brave this morning. Our worship pastor's gone. I'm 